Hello and welcome, my name is Dr. K. In today's video, we will take a look at 8 gait deviations specific to the hip, pelvis and trunk dysfunctions. Let's take a look. The first gait deviation that we will observe is backward trunk lean during the loading response. Here, the likely impairment is weak hip extensors. A possible pathological precursor can be poliomyelitis. This action moves the line of gravity of the trunk behind the hip and reduces the need for hip extensor torque. The next gait deviation that we will observe is a positive Chandelenburg sign. Here, we observe excessive downward drop of the contralateral pelvis during stance. The likely impairment here is mild weakness of gluteus medius of the stance limb. A possible pathological precursor is Guillain-Barre or poliomyelitis. Although the Chandelenburg sign may be seen in single limb standing, a compensated Chandelenburg gait is often seen in severe weakness of the hip abductors. The next gait deviation that we will observe is a compensated Chandelenburg gait, also known as a waddling gait. Here we observe lateral trunk lean towards the stent's lower extremity. This movement compensates for weakness. Typically, the likely impairment here is marked weakness of the hip abductors. It can be secondary to Guillain-Barre or poliomyelitis. Shifting of the trunk over the supporting limb reduces the demand of the hip abductors. Second impairment that's possible is hip pain, secondary to possible arthritis. Once again, shifting of the trunk over the supporting lower extremity reduces compressive joint forces associated with the action of the hip abductors. The next gait deviation that we will observe is excessive trunk lean during mid to terminal stance of the gait cycle. Here, the likely impairment can be hip flexion contracture. A selected pathological precursor can be hip osteoarthritis. Forward trunk lean is used to compensate for lack of hip extension. An alternative adaptation could be an excessive lumbar lordosis. A second likely impairment can be hip pain secondary to hip osteoarthritis. Keeping the hip at 30 degrees of flexion minimizes intraarticular pressure. The next gait deviation that we will observe is excessive lumbar lordosis during the terminal stance of the gait cycle. Here, the likely impairment is hip flexion contracture, possibly to osteoarthritis. Lack of hip extension in terminal stents is compensated for by the increased lordosis. The next gait deviation that we will observe is trunk lurching back and over the unaffected lower extremity during heel off to mid stance of the gait cycle. Here, the likely impairment is hip flexor weakness. It can be possible to L2 or L3 nerve root compressions. Hip flexion is passively generated by backward movement of the trunk. The next gait deviation that we will observe is posterior tilt of the pelvis during the initial swing. Here, the likely impairment is hip flexor weakness, secondary to L2 or L3 nerve root compressions. Abdominals are used during initial swing to advance the swing lower extremity. The last deviation that we will observe is hip circumduction during the swing phase of the gait cycle. Here, the likely impairment is hip flexor weakness, secondary to L2 
or L3, nerve root compressions. Semicircle movement combining hip flexion, hip abduction, and forward rotation of the pelvis are observed here.